Um, good afternoon. We are back for the two afternoon sessions. And our first topic uh, for the afternoon is contemporary Afghanistan. It'll be followed by an equally interesting topic, understanding the U.S.-Middle East relations by Ambassador Faisal Istrabadi. But for now, I would like to introduce our presenter for the first topic, Contemporary Afghanistan, Dr. Piper O'Sullivan, Assistant Director of Study Abroad, College of the Holy Cross, Worcester, Massachusetts. Piper received a PhD from the Department of Central Eurasian Studies at Indiana University, Bloomington, specializing in Afghanistan studies. Her research interests include Pashto literature, the history of print media in Afghanistan, as well as art history of the region. She was a visiting researcher at Kabul University in 2017. In 2021, she completed postdoctoral training in refugee mental health at Harvard Medical School. Currently, she serves as Assistant Director of Study Abroad at the College of the Holy Cross, managing 12 programs in international education. She also volunteers as a family mentor to newly arrived refugees in the Worcester, Massachusetts area where she resides. By way of education, she has a PhD and MA from Indiana University, Bloomington, BA from Mount Holyoke College. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Piper Sullivan. Piper, well, please take it away. Thank you. Okay. So, um, hi everyone. Um, I am very pleased to be here to talk about Afghanistan today. I'd like to begin by thanking Kasha uh, from the Inter-Asian and Neuralic National Resource Center at Indiana University who invited me to participate in this conference. I also want to extend my gratitude to Professor Raj uh, Shasti for organizing this panel. Indiana University uh, was where I received extensive training in Afghanistan studies especially in Afghan languages such as Pashto and Dari. My graduate advisor, um, Professor Nazi Shakrani, who is originally from Badakhshan province in northern Afghanistan, invited me to Kabul in 2017 to, to, to conduct dissertation research at the library of Kabul University. This was definitely the most impactful experience that I had as a graduate student. Uh, despite reading about Afghanistan for many years, actually being there on the ground surprised me in many ways. When I was driven from Mohammed Karzai International Airport to the American University of Afghanistan, where I had a housing unit. My first impression of the city was that it was very calm. I didn't see endless mounds of rubble or desperate looking people wandering the streets. In fact, Kabul appeared orderly, quiet, with blast walls um, surrounding the um, typical sort of buildings that you would expect, such as embassies, universities, and Shiite mosques that were always a target. Most people at checkpoints looked exhausted from the, from the monotony of checking the trunks and bottom of cars with tiny mirrors looking for sticky bombs. I remember having the distinct thought of why hasn't the Taliban already taken over yet? The city, from my perspective, was essentially defenseless. As American and other international troops were not in Kabul, but were preoccupied in the provinces far away, training the already depleted Afghan National Army. When discussions began, began about withdrawing from Afghanistan, U.S. defense officials reportedly expected Afghanistan's capital to fall in 90 days. It took less than 10 days. I'm not sure how defense officials calculate things like this. 
maybe from satellite imagery and the belief that the Afghan National Army personnel would needlessly die in combat, knowing that there were no reinforcements coming. But 10 days was entirely predictable timeline, even back in 2017, as I commuted from one university to another in a minivan. The Hamid Karzai International Airport, which would later become the place for evacuations following the US withdrawal, hardly had any checkpoints. The structure itself was no bigger than a stop and shop or Kroger. To say the least, it was very puzzling to me that this was the site chosen for evacuation. By far the most heavily guarded place in Kabul was the U.S. Embassy, which was connected to the ISAF coalition compound that had blast walls several stories high. In 2017, when I was there, to find the rubble from suicide attacks, you had to go to specific sites, such as the German Embassy and the diplomatic quarter uh, of Kabul. And these are pictures of the aftermath of the bombing um, by the German embassy. And um, another example is uh, would have been visiting the Shiite community in northwestern Kabul, where a suicide car bomb detonated, killing a group of government employees on their way to work. This incident happened the last day that I was there. My point is to say violence at that time was not random in the capital and very much served a strategic purpose. I often check Facebook to find out which streets or specific neighborhoods to avoid on a given day. The threat of kidnapping was a whole other issue and personally much more of a concern. Being a foreigner who was not embedded in the military or working behind the U.S. Embassy blast walls was highly unusual. Although I felt like a walking target as I maneuvered around Kabul, I would never say it defined my experience there. I made the most of my time seeing my Afghan friends who were also academics, visiting the National Museum and talking to students at Kabul University and the American University campuses. When I asked these students if they were tired of the American presence in Afghanistan, all of them surprised me by saying no, because they explained to me that the Taliban would immediately return if we, the United States, were to leave. Honestly, I was more frustrated than they were as I saw that we, the United States, um, not, achieved nothing sustainable there. Yes, the U.S. financed the construction of roads, dams, schools, hospitals, but where were factories to produce goods? Where was the blueprint to uh, build a self-sustainable economy? Opportunities to license Afghan opium for medicinal use or to build a nationalized mining industry were lost to problems with governance, corruption, and security. This trifecta of poor governance, corruption, and security concerns was constantly used as the reason to abandon what could have been creative solutions to economic problems that go back decades. And for the generation who attended universities in Afghanistan after 9-11, they have now either gone into hiding under Taliban rule or have left the country altogether. According to the BBC, since the Taliban took control last August, 229 professors from three of the country's major universities in Kabul, Herat, and Balkh have left the country. It's a tragic brain drain to watch. And again, I ask 
where was the blueprint for sustainability in at least the education sector? Instead of solely focusing on American interests as foreign policy, was there anyone in the US government asking what would best serve the Afghan people? In short, we failed to create jobs that could give young men a decent living to deter them from joining lucrative extremist organizations that perpetuated a war economy. One of the biggest motivations for joining extremist organizations is poverty and a desperate need for money. At one point during the American war in Afghanistan, the average government employee in Kabul made around $100 as a monthly wage. If you join the Taliban, that monthly wage doubled to $200. Then ISIS or Assan membership promised $300. If the idea of becoming a full-time member of an extremist organization was not suitable for someone, there were smaller jobs that could have involved dropping off a bag of fertilizer at a particular time and place. Such a bag would later be picked up by somebody else who would eventually fashion it into an explosive. For some of the poorest people in Afghanistan, helping build a bomb could feed your family. My point is that terrorism in a war zone is not always linked to brainwashing in a madrasa that can be fueled by extreme poverty and a lack of employment options. A semblance of security was achieved in the early years following 2001, but instead of negotiating with the Taliban at that point, we decided to wage war on them that would have no end. The U.S. has now been added to Afghanistan's long list of empires that have found their grave there. Afghanistan is popularly known as the graveyard of empires, not only because of its mountainous terrain that defies powerful and well-equipped militaries, but efforts in the name of nation building continue to miss the mark. Most importantly, external foreign powers have perpetuated a flawed model of governance in Afghanistan. Dating back to the great game of the early 1900s, Britain and then the Soviet Union and the US have all financially helped secure a single leader in the country. Whether it was one Amir, one general secretary or one president. The result was a highly centralized form of governance with undisputable favoritism towards Pashtuns from the Badakhsai Durrani tribal lineage. With a country as ethnically diverse as it is geographically complex, Afghanistan is not suited for centralized but decentralized model of governance. And for more information, about the great game in Afghanistan, I recommend watching Warry Stewart's documentary that's listed on the list of resources, uh, specifically episode one. Federalization would have allowed certain provinces or groupings of territories to assert more autonomy and help end the Pashtun project of internal colonialization that has left Tajiks, Hazaras, Uzbeks, Turkmens, and many other groups of people in Afghanistan politically powerless. Perhaps one of the most frustrating moments after 9-11 was the Bonn Agreement that took place in Bonn, Germany in December of 2001, and the proposal for decentralization was completely rejected. In Europe, Far away from Kabul, the fate of Afghanistan was determined by the United Nations and Pashtun elites, along with a select group from the Northern Alliance. 
they undertook a centralized maximalist approach to so-called post-conflict resolution with no regard to amending long-standing political divisions or providing much needed social services. As for these social services, humanitarian organizations would come in and operate for as long as they could in Afghanistan, setting up Afghan society to be wholly dependent on them and foreign aid. The Bonn Agreement established the International Security Assistance Force, ISAF, gave the United States and NATO the green light for experimental nation building and a framework for the later constitution established in 2004 with presidential and parliamentary elections that follow. The presidential and parliamentary models of government are very familiar to the US and other European countries and were therefore solidified in Afghanistan. Tragically, the international community ignored the lessons of history that showed us that Afghanistan rarely ever thrived under such conditions, especially in the provinces and for ethnic minorities. One takeaway uh, that I hope you have from this presentation is that Afghanistan's contemporary problems were and still are directly tied to foreign powers. One individual that I would like to highlight is Gulbuddin Hekmatyar. He is also known as the Butcher of Kabul. During the Soviet-Afghan War, Hekmatyar was a leader of the Mujahideen political party named Hizbi Islami of Afghanistan, who propagated the most hardline and extremist propaganda with the aspiration to transform Afghanistan as an authoritarian Islamist theocracy. Ironically, he never received a traditional Islamic education, but studied engineering at Kabul University before fleeing the city after murdering a Maoist student on campus. Ekmatyar was obsessed with his image he published more than any other resistance group during the Soviet war with magazines such as the Mujahideen Monthly that always featured his photo, often collaged with photos of large crowds of people to make it look like he had an enormous following. In fact, most Afghans desperately wanted a more moderate leader. Nevertheless, the United States was misguided in utilizing Pakistan's Inter-Services Intelligence Agency, ISI, to channel CIA funds to the Mujahideen, also known as Operation Cyclone. Gulbuddin Hekmatyar was the top beneficiary of Operation Cyclone, and it was estimated that about $600 million were transferred to Hekmatyar. 200 million per year from 1987 to 1989. ISI's favoritism towards Hekmatyar was primarily due to the fact that he was the most militant among the Mujahideen and a strong proponent of the Pakistani-sponsored Islamist insurgency in Kashmir. Additionally, Hekmatyar was attractive to ISI as the organization sought to build up Pashtun clients outside of Afghan's traditional royal tribes, the Durrani Barakzai lineage. Hekmatyar is a Yilzai Pashtun, and it was assumed that he would not pursue the establishment of a Pashtunistan, a nationalist objective of the royal tribes, but rather that he would maintain a pro-Pakistan position that would not threaten Pakistan's territorial integrity. In essence, he served as a conduit to benefit Pakistan's short-term strategic interests rather than 
in, intentionally selected to combat Soviet personnel in Afghanistan and the communist regime in Kabul. The dire long-term consequence of this decision was a sectarian and ethnic civil war that followed the Soviet withdrawal and that was exacerbated by Hekmatyar's unyielding goal of, elim of eliminating all political rivals among the Mujahideen. Hekmatyar mirrored Afghanistan's communist general secretaries in his fixation on eliminating potential rivals among the Mujahideen. In other words, revolutionary change to create an Islamist utopia necessitated violence. Thousands of Afghans in Kabul were killed in the crossfire from 1992 to 1996 as ISI via the CIA supplied Hekmatyar which, with a large number of rockets, which he stockpiled to use after the Soviet withdrawal. Therefore, what, what we can take away, what emerges most clearly from Operation Cyclone, one of the lar longest and most expensive covert operations by the CIA, CIA involving billions of dollars was that the CIA prioritized winning the immediate war over the pursuit of ensuring long-term stability in the region. When the Taliban emerged as the victors of the civil war in the early 1990s, Pak Matyar fled to Pakistan. When he finally returned to Afghanistan, in May of 2017, after his self-imposed period of exile, he decided to buy the property directly across the street from the American University of Afghanistan. But for a little while, he was my neighbor. <laughs> his enormous compound was guarded by tanks and the blast walls were decorated with images of himself. His return to Kabul was not welcomed. Afghan staff at the American University told me they lost family members during the Civil War because of his relentless attacks on the city. For the American personnel at the university, his um, you know, purchase of the property across the university elevated the already high risk uh, area uh, in terms of, se of um, security. However, despite all of that, he was still invited for a campus tour at the American University, an invitation that outraged many students and myself. Regardless, it was believed by some of his remaining supporters that he could possibly broker peace with the Taliban since in their words, the Western backed government was not working. For me, Hakmatyar is someone who embodies the words of the late Benazir Bhutto and former Prime Minister of Pakistan, who warned George H.W. Bush that his financial alliances with the Islamist movement in the region were creating a Frankenstein. And for more information about Hekmatyar and the proxy war in Afghanistan in the 80s. I highly recommend Steve Cole's book, Ghost Wars. We are all familiar with what would come next. The ascension of the Taliban in the 90s, Al-Qaeda al creating a base to plan the um, Al-Qaeda creating a base to plan the attacks of 9-11 and the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan beginning no less than a month later on October 7th. While we achieved our immediate goal of dismantling the Al-Qaeda training camps there, it came at a high price and mistakes were made by the U.S. military 
during the war that should not be forgotten. One of the privileges of being an American is that I can critique foreign policy and the blunders of our military leaders without fear. I certainly don't take this privilege for granted. Before I continue my critique of American foreign policy, I should say that I worked as a Pashto language tutor for several years to American veterans who served in Afghanistan. It was an interesting experience as nearly all of them had the desire to learn this Afghan language called Pashto and return to Afghanistan not as part of the military, but to engage in humanitarian work there. All of them had severe symptoms of PTSD. And while I don't think any of them ever actually returned to Afghanistan, they wanted to learn Pashto as a way to connect and better understand a people they thought, but never knew anything about. From my perspective, they wanted to create different, perhaps more positive associations with Afghanistan in their minds. Learning a language could be a gateway to help them lessen the burdens of war that they carried with them every day and meet Afghan Americans and potentially uh, imagine, you know, peaceful engagements in Afghanistan, if only in their minds. In the early years of the American war in Afghanistan, coordination between humanitarian efforts and military operations was lacking. Today, Afghanistan remains in the top six of the most heavily mined countries in the world with a count of 10 million that continues to maim and kill 12 Afghans per day. Despite the well-known acc accumulation of mines during the Soviet-Afghan War and subsequent civil war, the early months of the U.S. coalition forces air campaigns in early uh, October 2001 and through 2002 was especially egregious with the use of cluster bombs in Afghanistan. Cluster munition, like landmines, remains active for decades and are known to leave behind a significant number of unexploded bomblets. Up to 200 of these smaller bombs are contained within each cluster munition. The cluster bombs used in post 9-11 Afghanistan estimated to be uh, over uh, 1,200 containing um, nearly 250,000 submunitions were manufactured in the same color of yellow in size as airdropped humanitarian daily ration food packages. You can see that this is the bomb and this is the humanitarian food package. Each of these humanitarian food packages contained a standard 2,000 calorie meal. A lot of children picked up a cluster bomb and thinking that it was a uh, humanitarian daily ration. So this appalling mishap eventually prompted the Pentagon to change the color of the HDR um, packages and broadcast warnings to Afghans via flying radio transmitters and leaflets informing people how to differentiate between the two. On a separate but related note, cluster munition also continues to haunt Vietnam. Approximately 7,000 people have been injured or killed by explosives left from the Vietnam War era in Quang Tri province alone. The Vietnamese government now estimates it will take a century to completely clear its country from mines and cluster bombs from the war. The same could be said for Afghanistan. Although such wars can be declared over in political rhetoric, the lasting effects of combat can endure for decades, manifesting 
and uncounted munition harming generations of people in an invaded country. More recently, I am relieved to see the New York Times has spearheaded more investigative reporting on the use of drone strikes. Drone strikes were ubiquitous in Afghanistan and along the Pakistan border. Contrary to popular belief, these are not ultra precise weapons that involve multiple strikes to hit a target. There have also been numerous instances of hitting innocent civilians or what is typically referred to as collateral damage. The Bureau of Investigative Journalism estimates that the 400 plus drone strikes launched in Pakistan since 2004 have killed between 2,400 to 4,000 people. Of these, between 400 and 1,000 have been civilians. Under the Obama administration, drone technology improved and the second generation armed drone called the Reaper, for example, can locate a target to a single room within a house. But drone strikes are only as accurate as the intelligence they're based on. It's also worth noting that more than 4% of drone operators show signs of PTSD compared to 10% to 18% of deployed military personnel. Drone pilots with PTSD are just like any other military personnel who have experienced trauma, but they are also less likely to get treatment and the support they need. In reality, both of these statistics are likely a lot higher than what's being reported. And the long distance warfare is indeed psychologically damaging. And one of the best books I can recommend on the psychological impact of war on military personnel is a book called Zinky Boys by Svetlana Alexeyevich, who interviewed dozens of former Red Army soldiers uh, deployed in Afghanistan during the 80s. I want to now turn to the abrupt withdrawal from Afghanistan we watched in August. According to Larry Elliott from The Guardian, the response of the Biden administration to the military defeat in Afghanistan has been a scorched earth policy that is causing the maximum amount of economic damage to what was already one of the world's poorest countries. Prosecuting this war by other means involved freezing Afghan state assets held in New York. It has meant the threat of sanctions against banks and other foreign companies doing business in Afghanistan. It has involved halting payments from the World Bank's Afghanistan Reconstruction Trust Fund. It meant no emergency COVID-19 financial help from the International Monetary Fund. While the illicit opium-based trade is still going strong, the rest of the economy has pretty much collapsed. On average, firms have laid, laid off 60% of their workers. The price of basic foodstuffs has risen by 40%. More than half of the population is in need of humanitarian assistance and the poverty rate is in the reign of region of 90%. These are the highest levels of distress anywhere in the world. A combination of severe drought and decreased livestock and agricultural yields and the freezing of foreign aid has pushed poor Afghans over the edge, promising their daughters early for marriage in exchange for cash is seen as a lifeline for families that barely have a scrap of bread to eat. The UN Population Fund has warned that it is deeply concerned by reports 
that child marriage is on the rise in Afghanistan. The executive director of UNICEF said in a statement, we have received credible reports of families offering daughters as young as 20 days old up for marriage in return for a dowry. For an average eight-year-old, marrying her off would generate the equivalent of $2,000. On the page of multimedia resources, I list two movie recommendations. One of them is a movie called Osama. It has nothing to do with Osama bin Laden, but about a young girl who tries to disguise herself as a boy to make money for her family. The movie ends with her real identity being discovered by a mullah who eventually decides to take her as a child bride. It's a powerful movie and the first one to be filmed entirely in Afghanistan after 9-11. Despite the very depressing ending, it's worth watching to get a better sense of how children in Afghanistan in the most desperate circumstances do everything they can think of to help their family survive. And things look likely to get worse as the crisis spirals, with more than half of the population facing hunger and 3.2 million children suffering from malnutrition, according to the UN World Food Program. The agency said it has never seen so many people facing emergency levels of food insecurity in Afghanistan where all 34 provinces are affected. In the relatively wealthy province of Herat in Western Afghanistan, an emergency feeding center is running out of beds. There are some additional reports that people uh, have, are, are having their organs removed for cash. The limited humanitarian funding is a is a it, limited humanitarian funding is arriving in Afghanistan through UN agencies and some of the leading development charities, but it is a fraction of the aid that was flowing in to keep schools open and pay the salaries of public sector workers before the Taliban took over. Precise es estimates of the scale of short-term help being provided are difficult because conditions there are so chaotic. It's hard to say whether the cash being airlifted is actually arriving where it is needed. It is probably about 10% of the 8.5 billion a year that was coming in before the Taliban took over. Afghanistan's new rulers, do not have an economic plan. Um, they didn't have one in August and they still don't. The Biden administration, from my viewpoint, needs to stop withholding money from the country to avoid what is shaping up to be not only a humanitarian crisis, but what one can argue is turning into a crime against humanity. The U.S. is not a state party to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court that established four core international crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression. The U.S. participated in the negotiations that led to the creation of the ICC. However, in 1998, the U.S. was one of only seven countries that voted against the Rome Statute. The U.S. President Bill Clinton signed the Rome Statute in 2000, but did not submit the treaty to the Senate for ratification. In 2002, uh, President George W. Bush effectively unsigned the treaty, sending a note to the United Nations General Secretary that the U.S. no longer needed or intended to ratify uh, the treaty and that it had no obligations to it. This obviously coincides with the war on terror and the subsequent invasion of Iraq. 
what is clear um, is rather than selecting um, the Taliban or targeting the Taliban, the U.S. and its European allies are inflicting collective punishment on an entire country in the misguided belief that it is somehow upholding Western values. We have to keep talking about Afghanistan, reading the reports about humanitarian crises there to put pressure on our politicians to do better. Strong public pressure needs to be put on the U.S. to make sure this change happens sooner rather than later. And I was very happy to see this morning, for example, Biden has decided to release 3.5 billion um, of aid uh, to Afghanistan. So that was good news. Um, mass unemployment and widespread poverty, however, will not only you know, fuel the cycle of recruiting more people to extremism, but will generate an exodus of refugees. Already 1 million Afghans have fled the country, primarily seeking refuge in Pakistan and in, and in Iran, which are always the first two countries to absorb displaced Afghans. Pakistan undertook a program to finally dismantle the decades old refugee camps from the Soviet era, but now they are needed again. All of this further depletes the U.S. reputation in Central Asia and the Middle East. China has been rightly condemned for its treatment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang, but there has been no similar mobilization of international opinion against policies that are proving disastrous for millions of innocent, vulnerable Afghans. One thing that we can be grateful for is there is no major social media blackout. And we can read articles every day from journalists in Afghanistan. Uh, to reference, um, again, the multimedia resources, another movie I recommend is one that's called In This World. And it follows the journey of an Afghan refugee leaving a, a refugee camp in Pakistan and trying to get to London. It's one of the most accurate and touching portrayals of the refugee experience that I've seen depicted in film. While there have been some um, small easing of the sanctions to allow, uh, allow banks to do business in certain tightly controlled purposes without incurring, incurring sanctions, the World Bank says it is in the hands of its shareholders. The IMF says it is guided by the international community. In reality, both the World Bank and IMF are taking orders from the U.S. Treasury and State Department and have effectively become instruments of American foreign policy. Of course, we know that aid could be squandered or stolen once it arrives in Afghanistan. At the same time, though, this could be said of many other countries, yet only Afghanistan is being singled out. One last point regarding the withdrawal is this misconception that Afghans simply gave up their country to the Taliban. Afghan forces had an understandably low morale due to the high level of corruption in the defense forces. When the U.S. began to pull out and the Taliban began to uh, advance, reportedly offering amnesty and even cash to the poorly fed security forces, some of who haven't been paid in months to lay down their arms and go home, it's not surprising what happened next. When the U.S. announced a total withdrawal during Trump's meeting in Doha, that sent a signal to Afghan soldiers and police that the end was near and converted chronically poor motivation into acute collapse as nobody wanted to be the last man standing after others gave up. 
once the signal was sent or finalized under the Biden administration, the collapse snowballed with increasing speed and little fighting. When the Taliban infiltrated urban areas surrounding uh, around the country, the confidence that reinforcements from Kabul would come to the rescue was never there. It was essential, it is essential to remember that in the wake of President Biden's withdrawal, the U.S. pulled its air support, intelligence services, and contractors servicing Afghanistan's planes and helicopters. That meant the Afghan military simply could not operate anymore without U.S. reinforcements. I know I'm going slightly over time, but I want to talk about women um, in Afghanistan. Rather than giving you a, a rundown of what is already well known to us regarding the lack of rights of women in Afghanistan, I want to highlight their strengths and examples of resistance to the oppressive conditions they find themselves in. Even during the first Taliban reign of the early 1990s, women secretly met and learned how to read and write. I know this because one of my closest friends in Kabul learned how to read from her mother who taught her in the home of her basement. This was during a time when all women were banned from school. Other Afghan women would come to the basement and learn from my friend's mother. Other Afghan women would, um, yeah, learn from her. And it's no surprise that my friend is now a teacher and we first met at Indiana University um, when she had a Fulbright to enhance her ESL pedagogy. She was an English teacher at um, Kabul Polytechnic University in 2017 and received further education in India afterwards. Now she's in Kabul and we haven't spoken um, much since the withdrawal. Um, it's unlikely she's able to work nowadays, but I share this story with you because there has always been an underground resistance to whatever is happening in the streets with men dominating the public sphere. In the privacy of their homes, Afghan women are bursting with creativity. For example, Pashto poetry, which, which is sung by Afghan women, are called Lundays. They are memorized and passed down from one generation to the next among women. I've collected a lot of Lundays over the years, and I consider this form of oral literature to be another form of resistance. Through Lundays, women express their depression, angst, sexuality, witty commentary uh, on society through these short, short songs. Some are pretty over the top in their delivery while others take a more deadpan sense of humor. But to be able to laugh and find creative outlets um, as a war on women is once again brewing is indeed a form of resistance. And to be able to read some of these line days, uh, please uh, reference the books, Songs of Love and War. Never in my life have I met such strong people as Afghan women. For them, going to work or school was never a guarantee that they would come home afterwards. One remarkable trend was seeing how many Hazara women attended universities in Afghanistan, especially at the American University. Despite the ongoing slow genocide against the Hazara people that dates back to the early 1900s, they are remarkably resilient and they have fully embraced educational opportunities, encouraging their daughters to go to school. Fortunately, we can say the Taliban is not mandating the burqa as they did in the 1990s, but certainly a more tight fitting hijab is now required. Since withdrawal, some women have been allowed to resume classes at public universities but only in select areas, um, especially only the public universities in warmer, private, in warmer provinces of the countries have resumed classes. In the colder areas, such as Kabul, higher education institutions 
are not expected to open their doors to male and female students until late February. Aside from university students, girls have now been banned from receiving secondary education. Also, the Ministry of Women's Affairs has been disbanded, and in many cases, women have not been allowed to work. Nevertheless, I am optimistic that the women at of Afghanistan will continue to learn and get through these challenging times together. One of the bravest moments I've seen since the Taliban takeover has been women protesting in the street of Kabul who are clearly risking their lives. Another social media article that described the desperate actions of Afghans to board any airplanes during the evacuation as a form of collective resistance resonated with many younger Afghans. I'm almost done. <laughs> it's documented that Afghanistan has the highest percentage of people with PS PTSD in the world, and inherited stress or transgenerational trauma is certainly real. In fact, the field of epigenetics has shown us that the biomarkers of PTSD can be passed down from but mother to offspring. However, I also believe the far majority of Afghan people also embody the gene for exceptional resilience. This younger generation in their 20s, 30s, early 40s are incredibly determined, and I have no doubt they will find a path through this terror. I always say going to Afghanistan was both the hardest thing I've ever done and the best thing I've ever done. It continues to put things into perspective for me. And it was an honor to meet many, as many Afghans as I did when I was there and to get to know them. It was an honor to witness their strength, their kindness, and hospitality. I hope that if your city is accepting Afghan refugees and is helping them relocate from the military bases that you get a chance to meet them. Better yet, bring your students to a refugee nonprofit and have them meet Afghans. Since the US prioritized Afghan interpreters in the evacuation process, there is a good chance of not running into a linguistic barrier. Ask the refugees what they want Americans to know about Afghanistan. The answers you'll receive will be varied and I'm sure pretty interesting for both of you and your students. And I'll leave you with some of my favorite photos from my time in Kabul. This is my good friend um, that I was talking about who's an English professor and her sister who's a lawyer. And this was um, my beloved uh, driver um, Javid, who helped me commute to different universities while I was there, risking his life every day, uh, spending time with me. And then this, um, if you're from Indiana University, we have uh, an icon here. We have um, Professor Nazim Shakrani, um, who was my dissertation advisor, and we're here visiting the tomb of one of his mentors, Louis Dupree. And uh, this is a photo of me and Kabul looking very happy after uh, having lunch at, the, inter not at uh, the famous Intercontinental Hotel. Um, unfortunately, that hotel was attacked just days after my visit. So in a war zone, you certainly learn to appreciate the good moments when they come. So thank you for your attention. And I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Raj, may I make a comment? Um, this is uh, Junaid Sharif in. Um, I, I, this is, uh, yeah, I'm so excited because I tried so hard to get in touch with you, Dr. Sullivan, to about the Lande, because, uh, I, you know, I, I, I love those and, and, 
and I, I wanted to communicate with you, but I, that's not the only thing that I liked about your presentation. Um, it, it was really moving. Uh, from my perspective, because I started teaching at the Kabul University, and then I've been teaching um, for 40 something years here in the States. Um, what I would add to uh, what you put forward in an excellent manner is that uh, the American mission, you know, you looked at it from the foreign um, policy perspective rather critically. Uh, I find it, I'm a historian by nature, and I find it uh, rather different because I think as a result of the American mission uh, over the years, uh, there were institutions that did not exist that have emerged right now. And mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in the culture, and I'm a student of culture, the culture that you see now, uh, if you go back even right now in Kabul, you know, and I'm sure you noticed it when you were there, it's not the culture that was there during the, uh, the reign of the king when we were there. It, it's a different generation. It's a different culture and it's a different phenomenon. So I, I think some of that credit goes to the United States and the, the Western um, nations that supported the, the states. And some of that credit goes to even those corrupt governments that followed one another because intended or unintended, they did this, this change that I think historians will remember at some point. I just wanted to add that. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm so glad you did. Thank you. Yeah, this this is a, it is a really unique because we now we now have, we have a whole generation who um, a, has been born and received education in Kabul um, after 9-11. And uh, they are so like all young people around the world, so much more interconnected and using, uh, you know, social media and um, there, I mean, it, it, they were always on their cell phones and wearing jeans and sneakers and, you know, we're at, at you know, it was really no different than being, say, at an American um, college campus, to be honest. And, and so that is, that's, that is a remarkably different than, um, you know, decades past. Excuse me. Uh, as, as somebody who has lived as an American citizen in this country, the picture you have painted gives an impression that for every thousand dollars we spent in, in Afghanistan, we didn't even get five cents worth of return on the investment. And it was all a complete waste of money. Is, is, is that assumption correct? And if so, uh, are you trying to present a picture which is quite different from what the government has presented over the years, whether it is that of Bush or Obama or uh, Biden? I think I'm just trying to present um, the situation as I personally evaluated it. And I think it, you know, I think whether it's Biden, Obama, Bush, Reagan, I mean, all of the U.S. presidential administrations have really missed the mark in Afghanistan and perpetuating what, going back to the idea of this. In perpetuating the corruption, if anything. Yes, by virtue of perpetuating the, the idea of, of a single leader in the country. When there are so many different factions and tribes and ethnicities and religious diversity there. It's a model of governance that, that doesn't work. And, um, and, and so that's, that's one of the main points I was trying to convey. And, and the question of whether it's been completely, you know, has all, has, has this been a complete waste of money? I wouldn't go that far. Um, I would say that, it, yes, I mean, it has benefited um, people, certain people to ob obtain a education that was not available to them prior to 
However, I, I do need to obviously talk about the, the brain drain that is occurring before our eyes. We have time for a few more questions. Dr. O'Sullivan, my question would be, why couldn't these things be stopped initially? There are, the United States is a, the most powerful country in, in this world. We know wars are gonna happen. Why couldn't we go into a country and sit down with these kings or whoever these rulers were and and, and talk out our problems instead of having collateral damage as far as innocent people dying. You're, you have to rebuild the countries that you blew up. You're wasting government money. You're, 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 you're feeding radicals and the radicals have no care in the world whatsoever about their own people. It's, it's to me, it's political genocide and it needs to stop. Yeah, yeah, I, Darius, I couldn't agree with you more. Everything you just said is is so frustrating, um, and uh, I think there was just a fear of of honestly of creativity, a fear of bringing um, academics or historians or regional experts into um, bringing them to the table uh, alongside policymakers and people who dominate the field of foreign policy and military missions. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really think a regional and historical expertise is um, invited enough into the domain. And there's not a lot of discussion between these two. And, that, and, and that's, um, that's that's something that American America can definitely work on. You know, it, it, it's 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 strange that every war that we are involved in has to be abroad. What if all these things were centered in the United States? I bet our our thoughts and our action would be totally different. Um, we would be on the ball about wars within our country. You know, it grieves my heart to see that some of these most prominent countries in overseas have been almost just eradicated and destroyed by war. And these, the ISIS, uh, what's the other group of radicals that we had before? They could have been all stopped. If we had just pushed the issue of eradicating every radical group there is for the right to fight for what they're not fighting for freedom it's not freedom they're fighting for what is the war really fight what are we re what were they really fighting for it wasn't oil when they said they went over to in a, um saudi arabia and they took over a little time what's a little country called uh back in the early 80s when they took over kuwait all these things were just totally political. We need to look at our politicians first, find out where their true mindset and their heart is, and we can stop some things that are going on in this world. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a devout Christian. I just got ordained January 23rd as a minister in the church. I feel sad for a lot of countries that have been almost destroyed by war. And it's going to take it's going to take centuries to rebuild. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I, when I was doing dissertation research, one of the I, I was focusing on print media and collecting um, magazines and uh, transcribed, you know, um, academic conferences that were happening in the eighties in Pakistan among. Afghan intellectuals, and especially um, what some of the saddest papers were written by Afghan economists at that time, just evaluating the after what was happening uh, as a result of the Soviet invasion. And they predicted their economy at that point, let's say in 1987, that the economy has been set back at least 50, 60 years. 
and then the Taliban comes in, and now, I mean, it, it, we just, we, we have not taken this long historical perspective and the lessons learned from history and incorporated that into approaching um, you know, conflicts around the world. And we're so heavy handed in, in the military sense, negotiation really just takes a, a back seat and it's devastating. And, and, um, and, and I, it, for me, it's, it's an emotional issue too. And, you know, and it's, it makes me angry. It makes me frustrated. Um, and um, so I, I hear you and, and I, you know, congratulations on, on your, you becoming a, a pastor. That's, Mary, that's excuse me. We need to give other people a chance to ask them questions. Of course. Please excuse me, sir. Okay. That's, that's uh, other, other questions, please? Yeah, uh, Gary has mentioned the ISIS. Uh, to what extent is ISIS-K a destabilizing force to the new Taliban government? Uh, so ISIS is really, a, it is, a, ISIS is isolated. Um, nobody nobody um, except ISIS is a fan of themselves um, in Afghanistan. The, all the Taliban factions do not like ISIS. It does not, they were always fighting when they were there. Um, I think ISIS has, the number of ISIS members, ISIS Khorasan in Afghanistan has, um, the, the, the number of members has lowered over the years, thankfully. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, ISIS definitely, um, Mm, continues to, despite its its lower membership, um, d does some of the most horrific um, things. For example, when during the evacuation process, it was ISIS for Hassan that decided to um, do the, I think it was the suicide car bombing right outside the Hamid Karzai airport that killed, I think, 12 um, American soldiers there. Um, ISIS for Hassan was also the first um, extremist organization to attack Kabul University. Um, Kabul University was never attacked because it had Taliban students studying there. So actually it was, it was Kabul University was actually ironically a safe place for me to be. And I spent a lot of time uh, there. Um, and um, so they really, um, they, they, they play, um, just a, a really just devastating, um, you know, force. But I, I think their numbers are fortunately diminishing. We have time for at least one or two more questions. Uh, at this time, continue to record your uh, impressions and thoughts and. Uh, commendations and critiques of the presentation, and uh, you can enter them in the chat box. Any other questions? If nobody has questions, I'll turn it back to Darius. <laughs> yeah, turn it back to me. Um, Dr. O'Sullivan and Dr. Sashi, I am thankful for the opportunity today to, to listen and be a part of this forum. Um, foreign, our foreign policy needs a big overhaul. I think all countries that are our allies need to get together and sit down and talk some truth. We need to get away from politics for a minute and talk about families that are, that are lost understand what families do mean to these cultures in foreign countries. We have to stop looking at color barriers, ethnic groups, and understand that we are all under one umbrella. That's God Almighty. They forget about him. It's all about feeding your pockets and who has the largest bombs out here? Or what group is stronger? Nobody is stronger. You got to look at the casualties that are happening in these countries. 
Like oh, Dr. Dr. Solomon says something so ironic, collateral damage. A lot of people just look at collateral damage as really trash. Human beings, human, human lives are not trash by no means. And but when this forum is over, I would like each of you to keep in touch with me because I went back to school after 38 years. I, I left school in 85 and I came back in 2020 and I'm finishing my degree. And this right here is helping me to more understand about international relations, what's really going on abroad, because I plan to, I would love to be an ambassador to some small country when I get my degree. So I can go over there and 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 try to help people, this these countries. I'm not gonna sit on my degree like a lot of professors do that have the knowledge and the understanding to go out there and and, 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 and do the footwork and not be afraid to do what they have to do to make a little niche in this world to help other foreign countries and America to understand. What's going on over there is not going on in the United States. Let's get off of this high-powered America because there's problems here also. But let's work on abroad because a lot of countries have been destroyed by wars and it's going to take a lifetime to restore them. Okay, thank you for the, you. the, the opportunity. Uh, if, there are, if there are no other questions, we would like to adjourn and take a break for 15 minutes. On behalf of the consortium and the group that has gathered here, I would like to thank Dr. Piper for a very wonderful presentation. Please continue to record your uh, thoughts and impressions in the chat box. We will regroup at two. Uh, uh, at, uh, we have the ambassador presenting the last presentation on the understanding of U.S. Middle East relations. Let us try to regroup at 2:25 p.m. Thank you very much. Take a break and let us please do not leave us. We've got a very wonderful presentation by a former ambassador. Carl, do you have anything to add? No, we'll see you uh, right after the break. Yeah, 225, please. Thank you. Uh,